No, maybe. I don't think so. No, it doesn't look like. I'm pretty sure it's default. It's the exact same format as that. Yeah, exactly. When did you tell me not to use default themes? Oh yeah. Yeah. All right, cool. Hello, everybody. What's up? Um, we're here to talk about some Philips Hue Covert channels. All right. I'm Nathaniel Beckstead. You probably saw me last year. I'm a third year CSEC major. Documentation is the coolest thing you can do. You're the coolest person if you document your code and whatever else. Um, I love automation. A lot of my projects re revolve around automation. For example, I like to talk about Ansible. Um, I also gave a series of presentations last semester about botnet command and control through a couple different things. And let's do some more micro committing and make that <laughs> green wall. Hey guys, I'm Ian Furr. Um, most of you have seen me like eight times already this semester because announcements and stuff, but I'm a third year CSEC. I really like policy and leg legislation stuff. I have a lot of fun with it. Um, IoT stuff is one of my other things. I did a presentation last year. Yeah. About some of that. It's been a while. Um, I've also done a bunch of talks. I, uh, words. Nathaniel and I did an OS query talk last spring, and then I talked to, uh, with Scott about why you should do red team, blue team stuff, imposter syndrome, Shmukhan this semester, and some other ones smattered in there. All right, so we're gonna talk about a covert channel, but in order to actually talk about that, we first need to talk about what covert communications are. And really, it's two things that are talking between each other when they aren't really supposed to talk. So this can be anything from processes or network devices or even people. Um, back in the Cold War, allegedly, the foreign intelligence services had ways to tie their shoelaces that you can kind of see there that indicated different kinds of messages and the way that the shoe was laced would indicate different kind of things. So one of those could be meet at site A or I've been compromised, GTFO or whatever. And it's evolved since then to be everything from something like this to things hidden deep with inside of headers or uh, evil bits attached to the end of a DNS query or something like that. So covert comms is all of that mess. And then a covert channel is an actual implementation of some sort of covert communications. Do you want to do the first part? Yeah. Um, so we have, this was actually a project, we should probably say, this oh, was yeah. a project yeah. for um, the covert communications class which is writing intensive if you need that. It's a pretty cool elective, which is where we learned all of this stuff. So there's three different types of covert channels, kind of. So the main two are storage and timing. So storage is a lot of stuff. You can either be writing the data inside a packet or a header, like we said, or just the presence of something. So one of our first covert channels we made um, as an assignment was just put a file in the slash temp directory and anyone can read that. So if that file's there, it's a one. If it's not, it's a zero. Um, there's also timing, which is the data sent because, because there's a delay or because there isn't a delay. Um, so for example, um, was it two years ago, Nick gave a presentation, not this, this Nick, other Nick, about um, his project was in the TCP delays um, or resending them. So if it was and it didn't act back, it would have to resend again, and that would be a one. And if it did act back, it was just normal TCP communication, and that was a zero. And then there's behavioral, which is, um, kind of iffy, it's when you're observing some action. Um, so like if I scratch my right ear and that's a one or like that's some message or if I scratch my left ear, that's another message. Um, and the, 
I've seen behavioral really only in a paper by Daryl Johnson <laughs> and Bo. Um, so that's kind of a new one. Um, the main two that we'll be focusing on are storage and timing. So some modern examples that we've seen, uh, probably the coolest co <laughs> covert channel besides ours, of course, is the bass boosted Norwegian death metal um, <laughs> that Sam and his group talked about last semester too. Um, it's also evil bits. Oh, I, I can, don't think I, can talk I know about both. Yeah. Um, so the evil bits one was just uh, one of the challenges that we had last semester for our IT sec, and it was in certain DNS requests in a PCAP, there was either a zero zero or a zero one at the end of the DNS requests if you looked at the actual bits. And a zero, 0 would indicate a 0, and a zero, 1 would be a 1. And if you combined all of them together, you got an ASCII string for the key, or the flag. And then the Russian woodpecker is a really, really, I think it's high-frequency radio um, that's broadcasted from Russia. And most of the time, it's either static or sounds like nothing. But sometimes there's um, a voice that comes through and says a bunch of random gibberish which is believed to be some sort of secret code. We have no idea what it actually is, but uh, when we upload these slides, you can click on that link, and it links to the Russian, or not the Russian, the Wikipedia page. And then another one of the group projects that we saw last semester was a Spotify playlist, where depending on the songs inside the playlist, uh, you would be able to transmit a message. So it started with just the first letter of the first word in the song title, then it moved to certain bits in um, the song IDs, and then it kind of expanded from there. That one was really cool because they threw memes up on the screen in class, and there was nothing we could do to stop them. Um, and then we have our covert channel, which is the light bulbs, which we're going to talk about in just a sec. So the Philips Hue is kind of the basis for our covert channel, and for those of you that aren't familiar, it's a smart home informat internet of things automation type deal. What it really is is a bunch of smart light bulbs that you hook up to your Wi-Fi and you can control them with your phone or your laptop or the API. There's a whole bunch of different components to it, but the main ones you're going to see are the bridge, the lights, uh, some sensors, the app, and then external integrations. So the hub is basically the brains, and that's what exposes an HTTP, HTTP API which is the basis for our channel. Then you have the lights, which can change colors and make light, like normal light bulbs. Um, I have spent way too much money on them, but I kind of love them, so I justify it somehow. And then you've got the app, which is a um, iOS or Android application that allows you, to, allows you to control the lights either from on your local network or remotely with the Philips Hue cloud integration. And then there are the external integrations, things like Google Homes, Alexas, IFTTT, um, lots and lots of just other platforms which have written code to work with the Philips Hue Cloud uh, API and control your lights through whatever kind of service. So normally, the way the Hue works is you pull out the app, you say, turn on the bedroom lights, and your lights light up. You also have switches, which are just like the normal wall switches you have. Um, you can turn things on and off that way. You've got routines, which do things at certain times. So say at sunrise, you want your lights to turn on. They can do that too. Our covert channel works in a little bit of a different way, where we use the HTTP API that's exposed by the bridge to actually send a message from one point to another. So this is a video clip of a message being sent. It's really awful because I was trying to work a computer and take the video at the same time. But this is a message being sent back and forth. So that seems like it would be stupidly obvious and that our covert channel would actually have no practical implementation whatsoever. But we'll get to that later. So the way that the channel works is you have an init state, a mirror state, and so on. So the way it works is initially you set both lights to the same set of predefined values. And 
you develop the message that you want to send. After that, you encode the first character, and it can be any way. The way we did it was um, ASCII values, and you set that to one of the many values that you can set uh, for each light bulb. We use the hue, the saturation, and the brightness. So that lets us set three 255, or zero to 255 values, which could be a lot of things. But the way we did it was we used the brightness, and the different brightness values from zero to 255 would reflect different characters. The uh, hue and saturation were used to show that it's changing state. So those would be randomly generated values, which would be applied with the brightness in order to make the full message. So you set both things to the same one. You set the sending light to the message you want. The receiving light, or the receiving script, sees that, mirrors the state of the receiving light to be what the sending light is, and the sending light then sees that, and it goes back and forth, looping through this until you've sent your full message. And then you send an end of uh, file or transmission character, and the receiving light knows that, OK, message is done. I can stop paying attention now. Does that make sense? Awesome. So just like I mentioned, you change the brightness to match a certain thing. In the top case, you're setting it to a value of 89. The receiver sees that's an ASCII value Y. It mirrors the state, which means that the sender can send a new character. And we should mention that we're changing the color for each time we transmit to just some random color so that you know if you have like two A's in a row, yep. you know when, to, when the transmission has changed to the second A. So the way this all works is through the advanced features. Um, and that's the HTTP, A, HTTP API that I mentioned. This is kind of a security thing because the API has an API key that you send with the request. And that key lets you access your local bridge. Problem is you can't actually send any valid messages until you have a key. So you can either generate one or because everything's in HTTP, you can just sniff for a little while, catch a packet that's going to the bridge with the key in it, and then you can do whatever you want for these lights. It's something that Philips is working on to fix right now, but either they haven't or it's not common enough knowledge that people are using the HTTPS API because this is the standard way that everything is implemented. Um, yeah. So they also have motion sensors which enable presence detection with the system. And what that is is it's a motion sensor that you throw somewhere near the lights and when it detects motion, then it creates an entry in the API and depending on the way you have the app set up, it can do certain things. So this allows you, if you were a malicious actor, to say, okay, there's been no motion detected for the past hour. Nobody's probably going to be back soon. We can send a message and nobody's going to see it because nobody's around to see the lights flashing. All right. So this is our basic topology. So we have our sender and receiver computers, and they both communicate through the bridge, and then the bridge sends the actually changes the lights, which we don't really care about. We just want to get values from the bridge. Um, but this is all on the local network. So your sender and receiver will both have to be on the same private network to communicate, which is pretty lame. Um, so we implemented DNS rebinding to extend this to anywhere in the world because you're basically using the browser as a proxy by sending malicious DNS requests. And we'll get into why that works and how that works. But so this is our local network um, from the previous slide, but then the sender network or whichever one, sender or receiver computers is also connected to our attacking web server, which also runs a DNS server. So DNS rebinding works because of exploiting same origin policy. So normally, you can't make requests to a URL that, um, or a different URL. We'll just leave it at that. Um, so I don't want some random phishing website 
getting my information from my banking site. Um, so a lot of browsers implement same origin policy to block that. Um, so this is just a screenshot from Mozilla pretty much explaining what violates same origin policy and what works. So the important ones here are the same path. For same domain, only the path differs. So we have store.company.com and then different directories and files, but those will pass. We can make requests to different files and read and write from those requests. Um, different ports, different protocols, so HTTP can't talk with an HTTPS site, um, and also subdomains fail as well. So this is pretty locked down. Like Normally, only google.com can talk to google.com, and it can't talk to mail.google.com or google.com port 8080. Um, so this is pretty hard to get around unless you own the domain. With, in that case, you can send different IP addresses for the same domain. So each time you make a request, say like paypi.com, and that's my domain that I own, and we pull down this JavaScript file, and when we make that request, it gets from uh, this is just like an AWS IP address, 3.138, whatever. And then the next time we make a request, this time to debug clip.html, for example, we return a local IP address, which may or may not be the hub's IP address. So this is a path for an example path for the bridge. So if we know that, or we can scan the local network by making tons and tons of requests, then we can find that and we can talk to the bridge from inside the local network, even though we're on some external server. Does that make sense? This took me like two <laughs> weeks to figure out what was actually going on here. Um, so basically to wrap all of that up, first we make a request to our external web server, like a phishing site. That pulls down this JavaScript. And there's a really good site called rebind.network, which is basically an example of this, which will, um, if you're on a private network, it won't work on RIT Wi-Fi. It'll uh, basically do this, and you can open up the network requests, like debugger, and it gets your IP address from a WebRTC leak, and then it scans the whole subnet for different I, uh, IP addresses that work for your Roku devices, like your TVs, your Google Homes. I think it might do Alexas, too. Yeah, it just, it's not malicious at all. It just, it's a proof of concept. Yeah. Um, but it scans your whole network inside your normal home Wi-Fi network for all these devices and can communicate with them. So it, it's a pretty powerful attack. Um, and this really extends our covert communications channel. All right, so now we're gonna use this to steal all your data. We are, actually you are being proactive and doing all your taxes, and we are evil, no good, very bad people out to steal all your tax information. So first step is you have a Philips Hue system in your house and you wanna throw a party. Both your laptop and your phone are on the same network and the Philips Hue is on that same network as well. What you wanna do is you wanna have a great atmosphere at your party. So you find some app in the Google Play or iOS store that happens to have uh, some light flashing capabilities to make it a party scene. And you install it, everything looks normal, you test it out, everything looks great. Next step, you throw the party. You now have our app on your device, your taxes on your computer, and a Philips Hue, which is responding to all of our commands. What we do is then, while all of the lights are flashing a bunch of different colors, we have our agent on your computer, encoding files in the way that we want, and slowly send it into the queue. We then check those values on the bridge with our app, and using a DNS rebinding attack, actually pull that information off of your local network. Because normally, you would be looking for suspicious traffic leaving your computer, but you're just seeing traffic to your Hue bridge. And then you would look at your phone and you just see app traffic
from our app out to our servers. Now you gotta call your bank because you just got owned. Sorry. <laughs> so just an overview, install the malicious app, establish the connections, transmit the data, waste some time, and profit. We profit, not you. No, you lose lots of money. Yeah, so any questions? That's all we got. Pierce? What's your data export rate? It's around uh, one, oh, I can't even remember what that is. 10 characters a second, right? I, 10 characters per second, yeah. yeah. So you can, that's using one bolt to send and one bolt to receive. The queue bridge starts to choke a little bit when you're trying to do that same thing to one bulb. You can add multiple bulbs in a single request, and if you change multiple bulbs, you can exfiltrate more data at the same time. I've heard of a lot worse. Yeah. Like, that's not that bad. Yeah, it's pretty okay for using light bulbs. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Sam? So is the idea to use it on your own light bulb to transmit the data, or if the target has control of The goal is to use the target's infrastructure against them. So it's their light bulbs on their network with their client devices. And then we have some sort of agent there which exfiltrate the data out through the rebinding or whatnot. Any other questions? Awesome, thank you guys.